so page 934, Micah chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Baal, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Listen, the Lord is calling to the city, and to fear your name is wisdom. Heed the rod and the one who appointed it. Am I still to forget your ill-gotten treasures, you wicked house, and the short ephah which is accursed? Shall I acquit someone with dishonest scales, with a bag of false weights? Your rich people are violent, your inhabitants are liars, and their tongues speak deceitfully. Therefore I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you, because of your sins. You will eat, but not be satisfied, your stomach will still be empty. You will store up, but save nothing, because what you save I will give to the sword. You will plant, but not harvest. You will press olives, but not use the oil. You will crush grapes, but not drink the wine. You have observed the statutes of Omri and all the practices of Ahab's house. You have followed their traditions. Therefore, I will give you over to ruin and your people to derision. You will bear the scorn of the nations. What misery is mine? I'm like one who gathers summer fruit. At the gleaning of the vineyard, there is no cluster of grapes to eat, none of the early figs that I crave. The faithful have been swept from the land. Not one upright person remains. Everyone lies in wait to shed blood. They hunt each other with nets. Both hands are skilled in doing evil. The ruler demands gifts. The judge accepts bribes. The powerful dictate what they desire. They all conspire together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright, worse than a thorn hedge. The day God visits has come, the day your watchmen sound the alarm. Now is the time of your confusion. Do not trust a neighbor, put no confidence in a friend. Even the woman who lies in your embrace, guard the words of your lips. For a son dishonors his father, A daughter rises up against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the members of his own household. But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Saviour. My God will hear me. What is the key to success? How can I be successful? Um, A lot of people try to learn lessons from people who have been really successful in life um, and listen to their seminars and read their biographies um, and remember their quotes. Bill Gates said that he never took a day off in his 20s, not one. Albert Einstein said that the key is to never stop questioning. Walt Disney said the difference between winning and losing is very often not quitting. 
uh, Mark Zuckerberg apparently wore the same T-shirt every day throughout his working life in order to avoid wasting any time deciding what T-shirt to put on in the morning. Comedian Bill Bailey said success is all about your, your attitude and it's about saying to yourself, well, today is the first day of the rest of my life. Although, when you stop and think about it, the day after tomorrow is also going to be the first day of the rest of your life. So that gives you at least a, a couple of days spare where you can just muck about for a bit before you get on with it. Every time we think we've got the key to success, it feels a bit as if someone has then changed the locks. Success doesn't seem to come very easily, and even people who we think, well, they seem to have achieved it, would feel that maybe they haven't yet. Um, Boris Becker, in his biography, said, I've, I've won Wimbledon, I'd, by this point he'd won Wimbledon twice before, he's won it more since then, but he'd won Wimbledon twice before, once as the youngest player ever, he was rich, he had all the material possessions he needed, and yet he found himself on the brink of suicide. Or Jack Higgins, who uh, is the author of The Eagle Has Landed. It's been turned into a movie. He sold 150 million copies of 85 novels in 55 languages. And he was asked, what would he like to have known when he was a boy? And he said, I'd like to have known that when you get to the top, there's nothing there. What is the key to success? The, the Bible reading that we just heard included these words, you'll store up, but save nothing. You'll plant, but not harvest. Is that your experience? Is that how it sometimes feels for you? In work, in finance, in investments, in savings, in careers. Well, rather than, than listening to people who may or may not have made it in life, what we've promised you today is the Bible's perspective on work, finance, and trade. And in particular, um, I'm going to be looking at a part of the Bible called Micah. We just had it read out to us now. We're not going to look at all the details of it, but just pick out a few thoughts from it. Um, it's, it's actually the Bible is one of the world's most successful books. If you think, well, what work of literature has had the biggest impact on the world and on society down through history, the Bible would certainly be up there, wouldn't it? It's still um, a world bestseller. But of course the Bible claims to be much more than an ancient book of wisdom that has been hugely influential. It's more than that. It claims to be God himself speaking. Not everyone is convinced by that. I don't know if you're convinced by that or if you're unsure whether that's really the case. But either way, it has to be worth the hearing because the Bible's perspective is so different from the rest of society. And if there's any truth in the idea of God, then he's the creator. He's the one who made everything. He made all those high achievers that I just mentioned just now. They're all accountable to him. And the final outcome of their lives, the final outcome of our lives, success or failure, is entirely in the hands of God. If God is real at all, he's got to be worth hearing. Well, the way that God chose to reveal himself to all of humanity was to have a close relationship with one particular group of people quite near the start of our history, the people of Israel, the people of Jerusalem, and we're listening to words written by one of his spokespersons, a, a prophet or a preacher called Micah, 700 BC, and he is talking to them about finance and trade, uh, and he's got three warnings to give them. He ends with some wonderful hope and tells us the key to success. But before, before we, can, we can really hear that, we need to hear his three warnings um, about the wrong kind of success. Here's his first three warnings. They're, they're divided up. If you're looking at a Bible in front of you, you can see it's divided up into three sections, the reading that we had, and each of them is a warning. And the first warning is that God expects fairness. That if there's a creator at all, he's, he's not really looking for us to succeed no matter what the cost. He's looking for us to show an attitude that is fair and just and to do the right thing and to treat others well. And that is, is summed up in chapter 6, verse 8. Let me read that to you. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Uh, speaking about God here, it says, God has shown you, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. 
He has shown you, O mortal, these words are for all human beings. All human beings have been shown by God what is required of us. You don't have to be an expert in the Bible to have a sense of what is right and what is wrong and to have this sense inside you that the way that you are acting and and living maybe is not always right and not always God, not always good. We all know that and experience that when we're honest with ourselves. We know right from wrong and the Bible says God has shown us that. He's revealed to us what is good. We know what we ought to do. What does the Lord require of you, it says here? Well, nothing really very excessive, nothing very complicated, nothing very difficult, nothing harsh or onerous or unreasonable. It's a very simple thing that he wants of humanity. He wants us to act justly, to behave in a way that that is fair, to treat people as we would want them to treat us. Who can argue with that? Seems fair enough to act justly. The second thing he wants is to love Mercy, to be the kind of person who actually really enjoys helping people out. You just really like it and and want to do it. You don't have to have your arm twisted. You don't feel reluctant or grudging. You just think, well, here is someone I could help. Here is someone who needs a bit of kindness. You know, I'm not going to be harsh. I'm going to be merciful. And uh, I'm going to like that. I love doing that. To act justly, to love mercy. And then thirdly, to walk humbly with your God. You see, the key here is to know that there is a God and to live your life, to kind of walk through each day aware of God and and aware that you are with God all the time. A lot of our problems come from that lack of humility because we think that life is for me and about me. We become the center of the universe. Everything revolves around us. We'll do whatever it takes to benefit ourselves. But it's a whole different outlook when you, you, you sit at your desk or you walk around the shop floor or you go into your garden with God. Right there with you. And then, of course, you realise that life is not really for me or about me, but it's about him. It gives us that perspective. God expects fairness. That's the first warning. The second warning is that we fail because we cheat. Our investments don't always work out. Our savings don't always pay off. Our our careers are difficult. Our economy um, keeps hitting um, obstacles and difficulties. And there is a reason, the Bible says. The reason is because God sees us cheating in this area. And God certainly says that to this ancient city of Jerusalem. So just for an example, let me read verse chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. Chapter 6, verse 12, God says... Um, about Israel. Shall I acquit someone with dishonest scales, with a bag of false weights? Your rich people are violent, your inhabitants are liars, and their tongues speak deceitfully. Therefore, I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you because of your sins. Do you notice what he says to the inhabitants of Jerusalem? The rich people are violent, people who live there are liars, their tongues speak deceitfully. Deception is part of everyday life and later on the bible says it's not just jerusalem that had this problem it's all of society it's in the news every week i thought i'd have a look through the news um, over the last week and give you some examples of what the bible is saying i could really have picked any week but the talk is today so i picked this week Uh, and it's always there in the news isn't it so this week we had the pandora papers journalists published a leak of documents exposing secret offshore accounts used to dodge tax uh, and possibly to hide corruption as well, involving 35 presidents, prime ministers and heads of state, and more than 100 billionaires, celebrities and business leaders. And one person wrote to the the Times newspaper saying, yes, we knew that. How is that news? Not very surprising, is it, to hear that rich people are hiding away their money in secret places so that no one will really know what they're doing with it and whether they're playing by the rules or not. Um, Or another example, James Timpson, the owner, uh, the CEO of of Timpson, the shoe repair and key cutting shop, said that an average of two employees a month from his chain are dismissed from cheating, for for cheating, for for dishonesty. Uh, One particularly uh, creative person uh, was operating the till 
uh, and decided to bring in another till of his own, a kind of fake, fake till, and put it next to it and put half the sails into the real till and half the sails into the fake till. And he would have got away for it if it wasn't for the fact that when he was on holiday for a week, no one could understand why sales had suddenly doubled in that particular shop. Um, and th those, of course, are only the employees that were discovered, that were found out. Or on Friday, there was a, a, a story about the Glenfall Tower situation, a reminder again that the, that the cladding on the outside of the tower was, was tested on the cheap, that people were interested in making money uh, and cutting costs, and maybe most of the time that happens and people get away with it. But, of course, on this occasion, it turned into a really horrific tragedy. And so perhaps Micah is not wording it too strongly when he talks about violence. Rich people get rich and stay rich through deception and violence. And that isn't just true in ancient history, it's still true today. And, and the point is being made here that basic honesty in everyday working life, as we go to the shops, as we fill out uh, tax returns and expense claims, and as we decide where to put our savings and which, who to bank with, all of these basic um, decisions, basic, basic honesty in the, in the world of work, it, it matters to God. We wouldn't really want him to be God if it didn't matter to him, would we? And um, he won't let people profit from crime and succeed in that kind of way. He won't allow that to be the final outcome. And what kind of God would he be if he did allow that kind of behavior to result in, in success, ultimately? And the Bible says this is why all human beings die in the end, because we face justice, we're accountable, we're going to meet God. And sadly, that means destruction. And, and perhaps what might surprise you more is that in our Bible reading, God says, he has begun. Verse 13, therefore I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you. Even in this life, even before we meet God at the end of our lives, he's already begun to warn us. The alarm bells have begun to ring. And the things that we do in daily life to sort of build up our security and our finances and our success and our profits are already beginning to go wrong even in this life as a merciful way of warning us that all is not well. That is why success is always slightly out of reach. That is why you can be going about your, your business and, um, and, and doing well and looking forward to everything working out smoothly um, and, and then you find something has gone terribly wrong. A worldwide pandemic has forced you uh, out of business um, temporarily or, or permanently, or there's a, uh, a, an, an energy um, shortage causing the, the cost to go up in a way that means you can't make a profit, or there's a, a fuel shortage or a shortage of HGV drivers, and, and all of these things are just making it very difficult to find any success. And, and the Bible is not saying, look, the people who um, have, are worse will be less successful and the people who are better will be more successful. That's not the case at all. It's saying that really for all of us, we're living in a world where God won't allow us to achieve final success because of the kind of people we are. We're living in a world where we're always going to feel a bit frustrated and thwarted as a warning. We, we, God expects fairness. We fail because we cheat. And then the third warning, we are all to blame. It's not just a few bad people. This is me. And this is you. And this is everyone we meet. So for example, chapter 7, verse 2, Micah writes this, the faithful have been swept away from the land. Not one upright person remains. Or chapter 7, Verse 4, the best of them is a briar, the most upright, worse than a thorn hedge. This particular thorn hedge is recommended by the police. If you want something to keep out burglars, they suggest have a nice high, fence, high hedge uh, made out of these thorns. And God says, you know, people, even the best people in life are a bit like that. They're a bit of a hazard. They're a bit of a danger. You spend a lot of time with them, and they're going to cause you some pain and difficulty in time. And we can't even trust the people close to us, um, says, says Micah. So verse 5, chapter 7, verse 5. Do not trust a neighbor, put no confidence in a friend. Even the woman who lies in your embrace, guard the words of your lips. Have you 
felt that at times, even the people closest to you sometimes. You love them dearly, but you're not always sure that you can count on them. Um, it's a saying, isn't it? You should never lend money to a friend. How many friendships have had tension over that kind of thing? You often find when a family member, when there's a family bereavement, sadly, as people sort out the finances and the will afterwards, it's quite common for there to be tension and difficulty between family members as they sort out finance together. Even the people closest to us are difficult to trust. And I wonder if you found that in day-to-day life, the biggest block to success is other people. And if you're a bit of a grumpy old man, if you're at my sort of stage of life, or you be a grumpy old woman, uh, it, you, you, at this point in life, you start to realise a bit of a pattern. You start to notice you've actually spent a lot of your life, you know, writing letters of complaint or on the phone to customer services or going into a shop and, and facing frustration and disappointment and being in situations where you think, well, actually, this is not really very fair and I'm not really being treated very well. I hope that's not just me. Um, I sense that other people have had that experience as well. And at first you might think, well, I will avoid that particular company, or, or there's that particular employee must have been having a really bad day. And after a while you start to think, no, this is just normal life. This is what it's like out there in, in the world that we are dealing with. And, and often the thing that um, is harder to spot is that it's not just them, it's me. I mean, think of the time when you had been really, really frustrated with some organisation or employee that's not treating you properly, or even a, a family member who's let you down. Th- think of how you felt. At some point in your life, someone felt that way about you. P- probably it's happened quite a few times, and you didn't notice it. It would be too much of a coincidence, wouldn't it, for me to go through life and think, there's seven billion people in the world, everyone that I've met has been, has been difficult and not entirely fair and not always kind, uh, apart from me. Why would I be the one person who is an exception to that rule? It's just not plausible, is it? We're all to blame. Three warnings, but wonderfully the Bible gives us hope and says there is a different place to look, a better place to look for hope and for success. Here's the last sentence that was read to us. But as for me, says Micah, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my saviour. My God will hear me. He says, as for me, yeah, society's in trouble. Yes, we have a world that is trying to achieve success and going about it in the wrong way and is never going to get there. But I don't have to go in the same direction as every, everyone else. As for me... I could look in a different direction for hope. And the direction to look in is is the Lord. I watch in hope for the Lord. So it seems the Bible is saying that there's no real way that achievement is going to enable us to climb the ladder of success and enable us to reach the top, that, that there's too much wrong in our hearts and our lives. God will never let us get there because it's not really where we deserve to be, but there is a better way to reach the top. And that is to let him rescue us, to let God save us and give us hope, that God would come down and reach down to us and grab us and and pull us out of the mess that we're in. That is what Christianity is all about. God, my saviour, A saviour who loves to rescue us, who came into the world to become one of us, the person Jesus Christ, who ended his life apparently a a failure in shame and defeat and humiliation, executed on a cross as if he was a terrorist, a criminal. He became a nobody. He became a failure to give us the gift of success. He became poor so we might become rich. He became nothing so that we might receive everything. And and Micah says, this God, I want him to be my saviour. I'm going to make him not just saviour of the world, I'm going to make him 
my saviour. That's where my hope is. And, and what is, is Micah doing? Well, he's not actually that busy uh, trying to achieve a lot of success. He's watching and he's waiting because he knows the success is going to come really from God. Not that God is going to make uh, Christians more successful in, in business or in finance. That's not the promise at all. What it is, is that it's, it's ultimate success. It's succeeding in life eternally and having an outcome that is as good as it could ever be as a gift, a free gift from God. 